Hi everyone, it's Professor Primington. In this video, we're going to talk about how to use the first derivative, define critical points, and also intervals where the function is increasing or decreasing. So in the previous chapter, we talked about how to find the derivative for a variety of different functions, polynomial functions, rational functions, a product of two functions, composite functions, exponential functions, and logarithmic functions. The goal of the next two sections is to be able to sketch the graph of a differentiable function by displaying the prominent features, which include intercepts, any maxima, minima, or any asymptotes. One of the more important concepts that we're going to understand from using the first derivative is finding out where the function is increasing or decreasing on an interval. So in this section, we're going to develop a method where we can find the intervals where a function is increasing and where the function is decreasing, and then we'll be able to find out where are there any local maxima or local minima using what's called the first derivative test. So in this video, we're going to talk about how to use the first derivative to find what's called critical points and also where a function is either increasing or decreasing. Let's start with a review of increasing and decreasing functions. So the behavior of the derivative will actually play a significant role in understanding the shape of the graph of the original function f of x. In particular, we want to graph this function y equals f of x using the derivative f prime of x. So if we know the values of the derivative, then we can find out what does that tell us about the original function's graph. So let's first review what does it mean for the function to be increasing or decreasing on an open interval. So increasing and decreasing, a function f of x is increasing on an interval a comma b, so this is x equals a to x equals b, where you have a is less than x1, which is less than x2, which is less than b, implies that f of x1 is less than f of x2. So what all this means is that you plug in x1 into the function, you plug x2 into the function, and you get y values. Now, if x1 is less than x2, that means x1 is on the left side of x2. When you plug those x values in, it tells you that the y value at x1 is less than or below the y value at x2. This means the function is increasing if the graph rises from left to right. On the other hand, a function f of x is decreasing on an interval a comma b. If a is less than x1, less than x2, less than b again, implies that f of x1 is greater than f of x2. So again, you plug in x1 and x2 into the function and you get the y values. If the y value at x1, which is on the left side of x2, is greater than f of x2, then that means your graph is falling from left to right. So the function f of x is decreasing if the graph falls from left to right. In terms of the graph, f of x is increasing if you move from left to right on the x-axis, the height of the function will increase. And if you move from left to right along the graph of the function and the function is decreasing, that means the height of the graph will also go down from left to right. So the same idea will make sense if we consider a function h of t to be the height in feet of a rocket at time t seconds. So a rocket is launched. You count how many seconds after the rocket has been launched. That's t seconds. And you have the height of the rocket is measured in h of t in feet. We say that the rocket is rising or that its height is increasing if the height of the function increases over a period of time as the time increases. So in the next example, we're going to explore the relationship between the graph of a function, whether the function is increasing or decreasing, and the sign of its derivative f prime of x. Let's take a look at example one, increasing and decreasing intervals. Determine the intervals on which the function shown is increasing or decreasing discuss the relationship between the graph of y equals f of x and the sine of f prime of x over each interval. So something that you may have talked about in algebra class is how can you find out where a function is increasing or decreasing? Well, you only use the x values to express whether a graph is increasing or decreasing. So it looks like the graph is increasing from x equals zero, which is right on the y-axis, until you get to this hill. The very top of the hill occurs about x equals a half. So the function is increasing on the open interval zero to a half. Then it looks like the graph is increasing from x equals two to x equals three because the graph is rising from left to right. So it's open interval two to three. And then the graph is increasing again from four, x equals four to x equals six. So open interval four to six. It also looks like the function is decreasing or falling from left to right from the very top of this hill to the bottom of this dip. So this is x equals a half to x equals two, the graph is falling from left to right or decreasing. So open interval one half to two, it's decreasing. It's also decreasing from x equals six, the very top of this hill, to this point right on the x-axis at x equals eight. So decreasing from x equals six to x equals eight. The only other interval that we haven't talked about is from three to four. 
The graph does not rise or fall, so it's constant between x equals 3 and x equals 4. So we've talked about where the function's increasing and decreasing. Now let's talk about the relationship between the graph of this function and the sine of the derivative. So let's make what's called a sine chart. So we have an x-axis going from x equals 0 to x equals 8. So this horizontal line is just the x-axis, 0 to 8. Now label all the key points that we found from increasing and decreasing intervals. We had x equals a half, something occurred, x equals 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. Now when you're talking about the sine of the derivative, remember that the derivative tells us the slope of the tangent line. So we're going to find out is the sine of the derivative, the sine of the slope, positive or negative for the tangent line. Between 0 and a half, if I draw a tangent line, it looks like it will be a positive slope. So between 0 and a half, the sine of the derivative is positive, and we also know the graph was increasing from 0 to a half. If I draw a tangent line between x equals a half and x equals 2, it looks like the, the tangent line will be going down from left to right. So the slope of the tangent line is negative between a half and 2, so a little negative sign. And we also know the graph is falling from left to right, so it's decreasing. Same idea between x equals 2 and x equals 3. It looks like if I draw a tangent line at any of these points between x equals 2 and x equals 3, the tangent line will go up from left to right, so the slope is positive between 2 and 3, so the original graph was increasing. Notice that the slope of the tangent line would be 0 between 3 and 4, so that's represented with a 0, and it's not increasing or decreasing. Between x equals 4 and x equals 6, any of these tangent lines would be a positive slope. So between 4 and 5, positive slope. Between 5 and 6, also positive slope. And we said the graph was increasing from 4 to 6. So the graph is going up from left to right between 4 and 6. Then we said at x equals 6 is where it stops increasing and starts decreasing. So at x equals 6 to x equals 8, any of these tangent lines would have a negative slope. So 6 to 7, negative slope. 7 to 8, negative slope. And so we also saw that the graph was decreasing or falling from left to right between 6 and 8. So how do these intervals compare with the sine of the derivative? The sine of the derivative was positive, so f prime of x was a positive number on the intervals 0 to a half, 2 to 3, and 4 to 6, which is the exact same intervals as where the function was increasing, 0 to a half, 2 to 3, and 4 to 6. The sine of the derivative was negative, or f prime of x is less than 0, we found that out when the graph was between x equals a half and x equals 2, and x equals 6 to x equals 8, which is exactly the same intervals where the function f of x was decreasing, half to 2 and 2 to 8. So this previous example leads us to a very important result involving the sine of the derivative, whether the derivative is positive or negative, and the shape of the graph of f of x. So this is called first derivative information and the shape of the graph. For a differentiable function f of x, so you can find the derivative of f of x on the interval a to b, so that's x equals a to x equals b, we have the following. Number one, if f of x is increasing on this interval a to b, that meant the derivative f prime of x was a positive number for any x value between a and b. Number two, the function f of x is decreasing on an interval a to b, that meant that the sine of the derivative was negative, so f prime of x is less than zero, on the same interval for all x values. And the third case, if f of x is constant on the interval, that meant that the value of the derivative was zero for all x values between x equals a and x equals b. So one, two, and three, this is exactly what we found out from the previous example. The functions increasing meant that the slope of the tangent line was a positive number. If the function is decreasing, the slope of the tangent line is a negative number between x equals a and x equals b and the function is constant on the interval a to b if the derivative is zero for all x values between x equals a and x equals b. So example two, graph of a helicopter's height. The graph shows the height of a helicopter during a period of time. Sketch the graph of the upward velocity of the helicopter dh dt, so the derivative of h with respect to time t. So this is the graph of the original function y equals h of t, which gives you the height of the helicopter after t minutes. So you have zero minutes up to seven minutes. Looks like the graph is increasing until you get to height after two minutes. And then it's decreasing in height until you get to three minutes, increasing from three minutes to five minutes, and then decreasing from five to seven minutes. It looks like the derivative will change sign when you get to t equals two because it's changing from increasing to decreasing. And we know if the graph is increasing, the, the derivative is positive. If the graph is decreasing, the derivative is negative. So it's going to change sign at t equals 2. 
Same reason for t equals 3. The graph is decreasing on the left side of t equals 3, and it's increasing on the right side of t equals 3. So if the derivative is negative on the left side and the derivative is positive on the right side of t equals 3, then the sign of the derivative changes at t equals 3. And the same thing at t equals 5. The sign of the derivative will change there as well. So let's summarize what we found out from the graph. We found out that the function h of t is increasing from the open interval 0 to 2 and the open interval 3 to 5. Now, using the information that we learned previously about the sign of the derivative, h prime of t is a positive number, so where h prime of t is greater than 0, on these intervals, the same intervals, 0 to 2 and 3 to 5. So if we want to find a sketch for the graph of the derivative and the derivative is positive, that means the y values are going to be positive for the derivative if we graphed it, which means you're above the t-axis. And we also found out that h of t is decreasing on the interval 2 to 3 and also 5 to 7, which means that the derivative h prime of t is less than 0 or negative on the same intervals, 2 to 3 and 5 to 7. So if you're trying to graph the derivative and the sign of the output is negative, that means you're below the t-axis. So before we graph, let's make a sign chart for the derivative of h prime of t. So we're going to go between t equals 0 and t equals 7 because that's what the original graph had. So sign chart, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 minutes. Now find out what the sign of the derivative is. We said that the function was increasing from 0 to 2. So the sign of the derivative is positive, which means if your sign of the derivative is positive, you're above the x-axis between 0 and 2. Then between t equals 2 and t equals 3, we said the original function was decreasing, which meant that the derivative sign is negative. So between 2 and 3, h prime of t is below the t-axis. Then we said the function is increasing between 3 and 5 again. So between 3 and 5, the derivative sign is positive. So you're above the t-axis again. And then between 5 and 7, we said that the function was decreasing, which meant that the sign of the derivative is negative between 5 and 7. So that means the derivative is below the t-axis between 5 and 7. So here's one possible graph for the derivative, h prime of t. So on the horizontal axis, you have time in minutes between 0 and 7 minutes. On the y-axis, you have the derivative of the height, which will be the upward velocity, which is measured in feet per minute. So we know between 0 and 2 minutes, the derivative is positive, which means that the derivative will be above the t-axis. So between 0 and 2, you're above the axis, the t-axis. Between 2 and 3, you're below the t-axis. So between 2 and 3, you're below it. At 2, it looks like you have a sign change. So that means you went from positive to negative. So it's right on the axis, t-axis at t equals 2. And at t equals 3, we said you would change from decreasing to increasing. So again, you have a sign change at t equals 3. So at t equals 3, the derivative is 0. And so it's also on the t-axis. So, so far, we're above the axis between 0 and 2. We're below the axis between 2 and 3. Then we said the derivative is positive between 3 and 5. So again, we are above the axis between 3 and 5. And notice at 5, you have the graph was increasing to decreasing, so you have a sign change in the derivative again. So the value of the derivative at 5 is 0. And then the function is decreasing from 5 to 7, so that means that the derivative is below the axis between 5 and 7. So again, this is one possible graph. We don't know the initial value for the upward velocity of the helicopter, so we don't know where the function actually starts at. We don't know how far the graph goes down, and we don't know how far the graph goes up. But we know that the graph is above the axis between 0 and 2. It's below between 2 and 3 minutes. It's above between 3 and 5 minutes, and then below from 5 to 7. So as the last two examples illustrate, the construction of the sign chart was very important in using the derivative to analyze and sketch the graph of a function. The partition numbers for f prime of x, where the graph changes from increasing to decreasing or vice versa, they must belong to the domain of the original function f of x. And these are called critical numbers for f of x. So critical numbers. A critical number for a function f of x is a value x equals c in the domain of the original function f of x where either the derivative at c is 0 or the derivative at c is undefined. A critical point for a function f of x is a point on the graph c comma f of c where c is a critical number for the function f of x. So what this definition means is that you want to find these critical numbers where the derivative does not exist 
or the derivative is zero, so you can find where the original function is increasing and decreasing. So the critical numbers, f of x, must belong to the domain of the original function and are partition numbers for the derivative. However, you have to keep in mind that the derivative may have partition numbers that do not belong to the domain of the original function, and so they are not critical numbers for f of x, as we're going to see in the next example. So example three, critical numbers. Find the critical points of the following functions. Number one, f of x is equal to x cubed subtract 9x squared plus 24x subtract 10. We know that we can find critical numbers where the derivative is zero or undefined. So we need to find the derivative of f of x. So f prime of x, use the power rule, the sum and difference rule, and also constant multiple rule to find f prime of x is 3x squared subtract 18x plus 24. Now notice that this is a polynomial function for the derivative. The derivative will exist everywhere. So f prime of x is undefined, doesn't occur. So there are no critical numbers or critical points where the derivative is undefined. But you could also have critical numbers where the derivative is zero. So find out where the derivative is zero. f prime of x is equal to zero. So you have an equation to solve. You have 3x squared subtract 18x plus 24 equals zero. So you can use factoring to solve this equation. Factor out a 3 because 3 is in common with 3, 18, and 24. So factor out GCF of 3. You'll have x squared subtract 6x plus 8 left over. And now this trinomial that's inside the parentheses can factor even further. Two numbers that multiply to 8 and the same two numbers add to negative 6 are negative 4 and negative 2. So you have 3 on the outside times x minus 4 times x minus 2 all equals 0. And so if you have a product that's equal to 0, one of the factors must be 0, at least one of them. So 3 can't be 0, so ignore the 3. So x minus 4 equals 0, that gives you x equals 4, or x minus 2 equals 0, that gives you x equals 2. So x equals 4 and x equals 2 make the derivative of 0. So these are called critical numbers. So these are critical numbers. How do you find critical points? You need to find what are the points on the original function's graph. So plug in x equals 4 back into the function to find the y value, and same thing for x equals 2. You need to find the y value for each of these x's. So when you plug in x equals 4, you plug that in and you'll get 6 for the y value. So that means 4 comma 6 is a critical point. And do the same thing for x equals 2. f of 2, you'll get 10. So 2 comma 10 is a point on the function f of x graph. And so that's called a critical point. So let's try another problem. Number 2, g of x is the quantity 1 minus x to the 1 third power. Or you can rewrite this as the cube root of 1 minus x. So again, we want to find the derivative of this function, g of x, because we need the critical numbers, where the derivative is undefined or where the derivative is zero. So take the derivative using the power rule and the chain rule. g prime of x is equal to, the power comes down to make it a coefficient, one third. You keep the inside function, one minus x, the same. And then you subtract one from the power. So one third subtract one is negative two thirds. Now, don't forget about the chain rule. You have to multiply by the derivative of the inside function because this is a composite function. It's not just x to the one-third. It's a function to the one-third power. So the derivative of the inside function, d dx, of 1 minus x. So one-third times the inside function, 1 minus x, to the negative two-thirds. The derivative of the inside function is negative 1. And so one-third times negative 1 gives you negative one-third times 1 minus x to the negative two-thirds. Now, in the last chapter, we would leave the answer like this. It would, does not need to be simplified any further. But since we're trying to find out where is the derivative of zero or undefined, it helps to make it a fraction because the negative two-thirds power tells me that it's actually in the denominator. So you have negative one in the numerator. One minus x to the negative two-thirds is really in the denominator of a fraction. So move this down. So one minus x to the positive two-thirds in the denominator. And the three is already in the denominator. So we rewrote the derivative to be negative 1 divided by 3 times the quantity 1 minus x to the 2 thirds. So now, where is the derivative of 0? g prime of x is 0 if this derivative, this fraction, is 0. Notice that the numerator is negative 1. The only way for a fraction to be 0 is if the numerator is 0, and the numerator is always negative 1. So negative 1 can't be 0, so there's no solution to this equation. So there are no critical numbers when g prime of x equals 0. But since we're dealing with the derivative being a fraction, the derivative might be undefined. So g prime of x is undefined if the denominator is zero, because you can't divide by zero. It would be undefined. So take the denominator, set it equal to zero. So divide both sides of the equation by three. That'll give you one minus x to the two thirds equals zero divided by three is still zero. 
And so now you have 1 minus x to the 2 thirds equals 0. That means what's inside the parentheses must be 0. So 1 minus x equals 0, or x equals 1. So x equals 1 is what's called a critical number, because that's where the derivative is undefined. So if x equals 1 is a critical number where the derivative is undefined, now we need to find out what is the critical point. What was the point on the original function's graph that gives you a change in the sign of the derivative? So plug in 1 back into the original function to find the y value. So you have 1 minus 1 to the 1 third power. That gives you 0 to the 1 third power. What's the cube root of 0? It's 0. So this is the critical point, 1 comma 0. Let's try one more. Number 3, this time the function is a rational function. h of x is equal to 1 divided by x plus 2. So again, start off by finding the derivative because we are interested in finding the critical numbers and critical points. So h prime of x, it's a rational function or a quotient of two polynomials. So you need to use the quotient rule to find its derivative. So low x plus 2 times the derivative of the top or d high, so d dx of 1, minus the top 1 times the derivative, so d dx of the denominator, x plus 2, all divided by x plus 2 all squared, the denominator squared. Now take the derivative of high and derivative of low. So you have x plus 2 times the derivative of 1, that's 0, so x plus 2 times 0, minus 1 times the derivative of low. The derivative of low is 1, so you have minus 1 times 1, all divided by x plus 2 all squared. And so x plus 2 times 0 is 0. You have negative 1 in the numerator. Denominator is x plus 2 all to the second power. Now this one doesn't need to be simplified any further because it's already a fraction. So again, you find critical numbers where the derivative is 0 or undefined. So h prime of x equals 0 gives you this equation, negative 1 divided by x plus 2 all squared equals 0. So again, a fraction is equal to 0 if the numerator is 0. Well, the numerator is negative 1. It can't be 0. So you have no solution to this equation, so no critical numbers so far, but you also have critical numbers where the derivative is undefined. And since it's a fraction where you have variables in the denominator, you may have the derivative undefined. So h prime of x is undefined, so you have x plus 2 all to the second power equals 0. Now take the square root on both sides of the equation to cancel out the square power. So x plus 2 equals the square root of 0 is still 0. So x equals negative 2 looks like it's a critical number because that's where the derivative is undefined. But you have to be very careful. The definition of a critical number was it must be in the domain of the original function. If you plug negative 2 back into the original function, this is what you come up with h of negative 2 is 1 divided by negative 2 plus 2, after you replace the x with negative 2, which is 1 divided by 0. That's undefined. So h of negative 2 doesn't exist. So there are no critical numbers for this function because negative 2 is not in the domain of the original function, h of x. The next theorem is almost the converse of the first derivative information and the shape of the graph theorem, which explains the relationship between the values of the derivative and the graph of the function from a different perspective. It says that if we know something about the values of the derivative, then we can draw some conclusions about the shape of the graph of f of x. So the first derivative information and the shape of the graph. For a differentiable function f of x on an open interval i, we have the following. If the derivative is positive, or if f prime of x is greater than zero, for all the x values on an interval, then we can say that the original function was increasing on that interval. Number two, if f prime of x is less than zero, or if, or if f prime of x is negative for all x values on an interval, then we can say that the original function is decreasing on that interval. And number three, if f prime of x is zero for all x values on the interval, then f of x is constant on that interval. So what this previous theorem is telling us is that we can use the sign of the derivative to tell us information about the original function, whether it's increasing or decreasing. So example four, first derivative and the shape of a graph. Use the information obtained about the values of f prime of x to help provide a sketch of the graph of the function f of x equals x cubed, subtract so 6x squared plus 9x plus 1. So use the sign of the derivative to help you sketch a graph of the original function f of x. So where do we begin this problem if we need to use the derivative to help us graph f of x? Well, we need to find out what the sign of the derivative is. So start by finding the derivative of f of x. f prime of x is 3x squared from the first term, minus 12x from the second term, plus 9 from the third term, and the derivative is 1 is 0. Find your critical numbers. So f prime of x is a polynomial. So notice that f prime of x is undefined, does not occur. So there are no critical numbers where the derivative is undefined but the derivative may be zero. 
So now I'll take the derivative and set it equal to zero. f prime of x equals zero. 3x squared subtract 12x plus 9 equals zero. So again, notice that there's a three in common from all the terms that you can factor out as a GCF or greatest common factor. So three factored out, you have x squared from the first term, minus 4x from the second term, and a plus three from the third term. So x squared minus 4x plus three left over. And now the trinomial that's inside the parentheses will factor even further. Two numbers multiply to three, and the same two numbers add to negative four. Well, they're negative three and negative one. So three on the outside times x minus three times x minus one. And this is all equal to zero. So since you have a product that's equal to zero, that means one of the factors must be zero. X minus three is zero, which gives you x equals three if you solve the equation, or x minus one equals zero, which gives you x equals one. So these values are where the derivative is zero. So these are called critical numbers. Since we're trying to find out what is the sketch of the graph of f of x, we need to find out what are the critical points. So again, plug these x values, these critical numbers, back into the original function to find the y value. So plug in 1 into the original function, you'll have 1 cubed minus 6 times 1 squared plus 9 times 1 plus 1. That will give you 5. So 1 comma 5 is a critical point. And do the same thing with x equals 3. Plug it back into the original function to find the y value. f of 3 will give you 3 cubed minus 6 times 3 squared plus 9 times 3 plus 1, which is just equal to 1. So 3 comma 1 is a critical point. So, so far we have two points on the original graph that we know. We have 1 comma 5 and 3 comma 1. Now let's use the sine of the derivative to tell us where is f of x increasing and decreasing using a sine chart. So make a sine chart for f prime of x. So a sine chart is a number line. So x-axis only. So you only have two numbers that you really need to plot on this sine chart. x equals 1 because the derivative is 0 at x equals 1 and the derivative is zero at x equals three. So plot one and three. So where does it get its name partition number? Well, notice that the x-axis has been partitioned into three parts, less than one, between one and three, and greater than three. So you need to find out is the derivative positive or negative on each of these three parts. So let's choose some test values. So let's choose a value that's less than x equals one. I'm gonna choose x equals zero. So I want to find out what is the sine of the derivative at x equals 0. So plug in 0 into the derivative. f from a 0 will give you 3 times 0 minus 3 times 0 minus 1. So 3 times negative 3 times negative 1 will give you positive 9. So any x value that's less than 1, the derivative will be positive. So now using the previous theorem, if the derivative is positive, that means the original function is increasing or rising from left to right. Now let's choose an x value between x equals 1 and x equals 3 to plug into the derivative. I'm going to choose x equals 2 because it's between 1 and 3. So plug 2 into the derivative to find out the sine of the derivative. f prime of 2 would be 3 times 2 minus 3 times 2 minus 1. So 3 times negative 1 times 1 gives you negative 3. So the derivative is negative at x equals 2. So between 1 and 3, the sine of the derivative is negative. So again, if the derivative is negative between 1 and 3, using the previous theorem, the function is decreasing. f of x is decreasing between 1 and 3. And now we also have this region where the x values are greater than 3. So I'm going to choose x equals 4 as my test value. So plug 4 into the derivative to find out the sign. f prime of 4 is 3 times 4 minus 3 times 4 minus 1. So you have 3 times 1 times 3, that's 9, positive 9. So the derivative at 4 is positive. So you have a positive sign for the derivative. That means the original function, f of x, is increasing from left to right. So let's summarize what we found out from the sign chart. We found out that the function is increasing on the left side of x equals 1. So this number line will go to the left forever. So the function, f of x, is increasing from negative infinity until 1. And then the function is also increasing from x equals 3 and then on, because this number line goes on to the right forever. So f of x is increasing from negative infinity to 1, but also 3 to infinity. So put a union between those because you want those two intervals together. And we also found out the sine of the derivative is negative, or f of x is decreasing between 1 and 3. So f of x is decreasing on the open interval 1 to 3. So let's put all this information together to provide a sketch of the graph of this function. So we have three points that we can plot on the graph of f of x. We have the critical points 1 comma 5 and 3 comma 1, and also Notice if you plug in x equals 0 into the function, you'll get the y-intercept. So if you plug in 0, the y value is 1. So the y-intercept is 0, 1. We can also have that point plotted. So 0, 1, the graph must pass through 0, 1. 
1 comma 5 is a critical point, so CP, and 3 comma 1 is also a critical point. Now let's use the sign of the derivative to tell us is the graph increasing or decreasing. We found out the graph is increasing from negative infinity to 1. So the graph is going up until you get to x equals 1. So the graph is going up. It has to pass through 0 comma 1. It goes up until you get to x equals 1. So at x equals 1, it looks like you have the top of a hill because at x equals 1, it changes to decreasing. The function is decreasing between 1 and 3. So between x equals 1 and x equals 3, the graph is falling from left to right, so it's decreasing. So it has to go through 1 comma 5. It also has to go through 3 comma 1, so it's falling between those two points. But at x equals 3, the graph changes back to increasing. So you have a point where the graph changes from decreasing to increasing, so you have a bottom of this valley is the critical point 3 comma 1. And then the graph is increasing from 3 on. So the graph goes up from 3 to infinity. And so this is one possible sketch for the graph of the function f of x, x cubed minus 6x squared plus 9x plus 1. So as we saw in the previous example, we can use the critical numbers of the function f of x to help us determine the open intervals where a function is either increasing or decreasing using a sign chart for the derivative. So let's do the same thing with the next example. Example 5, intervals of increasing and decreasing. Find the critical numbers of f of x equals 16 times natural log of x, subtract 2x squared, and the intervals on which the function is increasing and decreasing. So again, if we want to find out the critical numbers, we need to start with finding the derivative. So f prime of x is 16 is the coefficient, so you keep it. The derivative of natural log of x is 1 divided by x minus the derivative of 2x squared is 4x. So 16 divided by x, subtract 4x, is the derivative of f prime of x. Now again, previously we would leave the answer like this, and it's perfectly fine. But again, we want to find out where are the critical numbers. So we want to find out where is this derivative of 0 or undefined. So we need to do a little bit of simplifying. Notice that you can rewrite this. So you can have a common denominator. So the first fraction already has an x in the denominator, so it's perfectly fine. Subtract, rewrite 4x as 4x squared divided by x, so that, that way you have an LCD of x. So now you can rewrite it as one fraction. 16 minus 4x squared is in the numerator, and the common denominator is x. And now we can do a little bit of simplifying even further in the numerator. 16 minus 4x squared, notice that there's a 4 in common with 16 and 4x squared, so you can factor out a GCF of 4, greatest common factor. You have a 4 minus x squared left from the two terms. And now 4 minus x squared, that's a difference of 2 squares. So 4 is 2 squared, and x squared is x squared. So 4 minus x squared will factor as 2 minus x and 2 plus x. And don't forget about the denominator, it's just x. So let's find out all the critical numbers. Where is the derivative undefined? It's where the denominator is 0. So f prime of x is undefined if x equals 0. So that's a critical number. Where is the derivative of 0? f prime of x equals 0 if the numerator is 0 for this fraction. So 4 times 2 minus x in parentheses times 2 plus x in parentheses equals 0. Since you have a product that's equal to 0, one of them has to be 0. So 4 can't be 0, so ignore it. 2 minus x equals 0 gives you x equals 2 and 2 plus x equals 0 gives you x equals negative 2. So it looks like you have three critical numbers, x equals 0, x equals 2, and x equals negative 2 for your sign chart. But you have to be very careful. You have to remember the critical numbers only exist if they're part of the domain of the original function. So notice that the original function involves a natural logarithm. Well, we talked about the natural logarithm. Whatever the argument is must be positive. It must be a positive number. So the domain for this function, f of x, x must be 0 or 0 to infinity. So that means you can only consider the x values for your critical numbers that are positive. So x equals 0, that's not a positive number. So ignore it. It's not actually a critical number because it's not part of the domain. x equals 2 is a critical number because it's positive. And x equals negative 2 is a negative value, so it's not a critical number. So the only critical number that actually is part of the domain is x equals 2. So when you make your sign chart, only include x equals 2. So x equals 2 goes on this sign chart or number line for the derivative f prime of x. So let's include 0 because anything to the left of 0 is not actually part of the domain of the original function. So 0, 2, and that's it. So again, this critical number, x equals 2, partitions the number line into two parts. Less than 2, greater than 2. So let's choose an x value that's less than 2. So let's plug in x equals 1 as a test value into the derivative. So f prime of 1 would be 4 times 
2 minus 1 times 2 plus 1. The numerator will give you 12, and the denominator is 1 after you plug the x is 1. So you get positive 12. That means the derivative is a positive number. So if it's a positive number, the original function f of x is increasing. And now I need a test value that's greater than x equals 2, so let's choose x equals 3. So if I plug x equals 3 into the derivative, I find out that f prime of 3 is 4 times 2 minus 3 times 2 plus 3, all divided by 3. So the numerator is negative 20 and the denominator is 3. So you get a negative number for the derivative at 3. So any x value that's greater than 2, the derivative will be a negative value, which means the original function is decreasing from left to right. So how do you find the intervals where the function is increasing and decreasing? It looks like the function will be increasing starting at x equals 0 to 2. So 0 to 2, not including 0 or 2. And then the function is decreasing from 2 on. So it's decreasing from 2 to infinity. So this previous example illustrates two very important points. Number one, do not assume that all the partition numbers for the derivative f prime of x are actually critical numbers of the function f of x. In order to be a critical number for f of x, a partition number for the derivative must also be in the domain, and we saw that in the last example. x equals 0 was not part of the domain of, of f of x, and x equals negative 2 was not part of the domain of f of x. So even though they're critical numbers, they're not actually partition numbers, which meant on the sign chart we only included the critical number x equals 2. And then the other important idea, number 2, the intervals on which a function f of x is increasing or decreasing must always be expressed in terms of open intervals that are subsets of the domain of f of x. So on this last example, we didn't have the function was increasing from negative infinity to 2 because the domain was from 0 to infinity. So the function was only increasing from 0 to 2, and then the function was decreasing from 2 to infinity. So only write intervals where the function is increasing and decreasing that are also part of the domain. So this is a good place to stop our video now that we've talked about how to use the first derivative to find the critical numbers and critical points and also intervals where the function is increasing or decreasing. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about local maxima, local minima, and the first derivative test.